Hello, today I am um, joined by Gemma Black. Um, she's a full stack uh, developer at uh, Kema Data um, and she's going to talk to us about her experience and her journey uh, from studying biomedicine uh, into becoming a full stack developer. Um, so welcome Gemma, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, like thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to be I know that you already told me about your story and it's just, I found it fascinating. Um, even because, you know, you, you went from uh, studying biomedicine to becoming a developer, which is something completely different. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, can you, yeah. Can you share your, your experience and stuff? <laughs> Like, you know, it'll be, a, it'll be a pleasure. I I genuinely, I've been thinking about how I would tell this in like a really short way, because I feel I don't, there's certain things in my life I just don't do like directly. I seem to go all the way around the houses. And this was one of those ones. Um, I, I finished studying biomedical science. I actually wanted to be a doctor, but again, instead of studying medicine, I, I decided I would study biomedical science first. And, and afterwards, I wanted to take a year out, primarily to save up some money to work, gain a little bit of um, uh, experience in the hospital setting. And when I, I didn't get through like to the universities I wanted, I was, I was looking to do a graduate's program, which is a shortened medical degree. Um, but when I didn't get in, I tried again and Warwick University again said no, but we consider you for the five year course, um, which is the, the, the traditional medical degree. And by that time I had started coding. I was doing other creative things. I was playing my guitar, um, playing with a bunch of people. I was having so much fun exploring these other things that I just ignored because I was so focused on becoming um, a doctor and doing my degree that, you know, I, I enjoyed these things. I didn't even realize there was more to life than, than, than science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. And um, so you started by creating a, or by recreating a guest book site, right? Yes. Yeah. My, actually, I, my first experience of code was when I was about 14, 15. It was during the days where before Facebook, you had like those guest book sites. I don't know, I don't know what the names of them are now, but you basically would set up one and then you can just like chat in a guest book, this never ending, this never ending chat site that you have personally. And my friend shared it with me and I was like, this is amazing. It just doesn't look very good. <laughs> how, <laughs> how difficult can it be to make it look better? And of course, I, I decided to look up like BBC's website or something like that. And I looked at their markup and I was like, is that it? I have to learn this. And actually it was a lot harder. When I, when I figured out a little bit of HTML and like H1 tags, I, it still, whatever I created still didn't look good. And I was like, oh, this is taking long. Then I realized I needed like a database. I needed to learn a scripting language. And I just like, I was like, I'm fine, I give up. Um, <laughs> and I'm not gonna try to do this anymore. But during that gap year, um, I started to explore web development again. And by this time, WordPress had come out mm -hmm. and it changed everything because it literally just did the back end for me. I was like, amazing. I don't have to touch anything to do with that, that back end stuff except what, for what WordPress gives to me. And I was able to create a front end. And that was the beginning of it. And of course, like, like yourself, once you say you know how to make a website, everyone's asking you, like, can you make me a website? And then of course, I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially with WordPress, because you can make so much with WordPress. Um, and then you have so much, uh, so many plugins. And you, yeah, you can do everything with WordPress. Um, and you know, I remember those guestbook websites. Uh, I think I had one. I think there was like a 
free uh, account or a free place where you could have your own guestbook site. Yes, um, that's it. <laughs> yeah, and then you can customize it and stuff. So it was it was so fun to, to do something like that. Uh, and this was ages ago, I think. I don't know, maybe 98 or something like that. I don't know. Jeez, yes. Uh, something, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> there was like MySpace around at the time and you could do yes. all these little cool things on MySpace. So it was awesome. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't like business savvy to create, you know, those templates. People were selling templates from MySpace mm -hmm. and uh, I enjoyed that so much. Um, but I didn't, yeah, I didn't actually monetize it. I was just one of those people that was happy to just code in my spare time. Um, but eventually I, I realized I didn't really want to, to go back to medical school, but I had to, to really think about what, what is it I'm going to do? And of course I couldn't really tell my family. I just spent three years studying um, <laughs> and not come out with a, like some sort of a, like a job which, which justified it. So I, I, I did an internship at a company called Marketeers 4DC. And I remember creating a portfolio. I didn't really have much work to show um, for it, but the portfolio in, in and of itself was like a, a representation of my skills. And I used jQuery. Um, so this was actually a few years after. And they actually brought me on. I couldn't believe that they did, considering that there wasn't any commercial experience that I had or I didn't go to university to study computer science. And they said, yeah. Um, so was the that internship that um, kind of made you want to go into development or was it because you were already doing some websites, uh, WordPress websites, and you kind of enjoyed the, um, the development process or um, you, oh, I know that you don't have to worry about backend and now you have to, but uh, when you were yeah. starting, uh, was it that... Um, so I going wanted to yeah no sorry I, I genuinely wanted to be a developer and i, I thought I, di i didn't feel comfortable applying for say even a junior role because i just felt i didn't have the experience and and even now if i if i see junior roles they still ask for quite a bit of experience and i always find that fascinating um so i thought if i do the internship whatever i learn and whatever i build during that time at least i can then apply for something and um when I when I got there, I thought I knew a little bit about coding, and then I just realized, yeah, I, I don't really know that much at all. <laughs> In comparison, to, you know, I, I was with really smart people as well. So um, they, I was so humble. They were able to teach me like the fundamentals, like what is a class and what is an instance. I didn't have any idea, and using jQuery, of course. I was never, I was never really going to to get into like inheritance and all that stuff. Um, but by the time I'd finished my internship, um, they said to me, uh, "Would you like to stay on?" And I get paid like properly um, because at the time it was uh, an internship where they only paid expenses and and whatnot. So I was working on the weekends to to help get by. And so of course I said yes. I will definitely <laughs> work for you. <laughs> Of course, I will work for you. And I, these were the, the the most wonderful people to work for. They were so kind. And they literally would sit with me, um, the senior developers, and just pair a program and show me how to structure code, show me what MVC was. They taught me what the Zen framework was. Um, and then I was able to apply that to, to the front end. So I'm like, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to them. So you you think that it definitely this internship was what really opened the doors for you to the developer world and um we always say that or we always hear people say that when you are um looking for a position for your first position uh try to find a junior uh level position um because it would be easier because the company won't expect you to know as much as a junior, a junior developer yeah. uh, those positions are quite hard to find though uh, most of the times <laughs> yeah. you can find a front-end developer back-end developer but yeah junior developers unless it's an internship it's it's a bit hard um, but it looks awesome that you had someone that uh, could mentor you and help you uh, grow 
Um, and yeah, pair programming um, help you Definitely. become what you are now. I guess that was like the, the grounding steps. Um, just just out of curiosity, you said that you didn't want to um, pursue medicine. Was there any particular reason why you didn't want to pursue medicine instead of? Um... That's a good question. Well, the I when I when I think about it now, looking back, one of the things that that encouraged me to study medicine was when I saw my grandmother. She was incredibly sick throughout my lifetime, and she died when I was when I was about sixteen. And when I saw how sick she was, I was determined that actually I will be a doctor. And anyone who comes to me, I will like fight so hard to make sure they don't have to go through what she went through. And so from about the age of about eight, between eight and 10, I made that decision. Mm -hmm. And I think once she had passed away, I think that determination had, had gone because, you know, she was the, the impetus for it. And by that time, I think my, my focus had always been on like science, maths, biology, those things, studying those things that um, I didn't really pursue any alternative alternative ideas of, of what I should do with my life. So when I realized actually, I genuinely like coding. I like the actual process of sitting down and writing code. And I, I enjoyed you know, playing guitar just as much, but I didn't really see how I was gonna make a living from that. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and when I got the 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 rejection, um, and they were like, I know that it was nice to be considered for the the full like tr the traditional course. When I got the rejection, I, it it actually made me think: Do I really want to pursue this? It's going to cost you know a certain amount of of money and extra more time. Where there is something now that I actually like. Mm -hmm. If I can do that now, maybe I, I don't. I don't need to, to go down this path because I've I've just put my mind to it from when I was little that I should. Yeah. So I was happy to backtrack. And I, I didn't feel like I had wasted time studying biomedical science. I, I believe I've benefited from it, but I wasn't afraid to, to just change course at that time. So, uh, and that's really brave because sometimes when you are studying three, uh, three years of a particular subject, even if you don't like the particular subject, um, you kind of feel like okay i spend all this money and time and uh, all this effort i need to do something with it um and, and i i have to say it's it's amazing that you decided or you had maybe a soul searching moment that you said no i this is what i enjoy doing and this is what i want to do um we have a, a question as well and this kind of relates as well so since you didn't study uh, computer science or any um coding, uh, programming, um, IT uh, degree. Did you have any projects in your portfolio when you got that internship or? Um... Yeah, I, I felt that I needed to have something that represented a, a skill set that I had acquired. Even if it was limited, I knew they might laugh at what I, whatever I did. Um, but I created this, this site and it was basically a blog but there was animations as it went from post to post. And um, actually the first project I got during the internship was from uh, the designer who said, uh, I want you to do exactly what you did for your portfolio, but for this design. I was like, okay, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I did. And, you know, um, it, that like, I literally, I literally felt that they, whatever reason they, they they chose to, to take me on. I literally felt that um, it was because of the portfolio that gave me the opportunity. If I just said I, I really want to code, um, I'm not too sure if they would have been as convinced, so. Yeah, it, and again, like I said, if you don't have that degree and you see a lot of um, job offers where they say, oh, you have to have uh, 10 years of, um, I don't know, Java experience, <laughs> and you have to have uh, three years of React and et cetera. And you don't have that um, experience as working, but you have projects that you can show that at least you know what you're doing. And uh, did you have the code in, on GitHub or somewhere else? Or did you show the code when you were um, interviewing? 
um, actually, I had a working site. Um, this is the thing. I didn't know anything about GitHub at the time. This was, when was this? 2012. I didn't know what version control was. This is how bad I was. Um, the first version control uh, uh, software we used was um, Subversion. I don't know if I don't know if it's around now. Um, so, like, literally, my knowledge of professional development was <laughs> was so limited. But the the portfolio itself, they could go to the web. It doesn't exist now. They could go to the website, and they could try it out. And um, they didn't actually look at the code. That was. Mm. That was actually yeah something I didn't realize. <laughs> they didn't look at the code; they just looked at the final product. Yeah. And they, I think they believed that I actually did that. But thankfully, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in a way, what really caught their eyes was the design of your um, blog. So that yeah. was the main thing, right? Yeah, I think you're in. Um, like you have a, a great. Um, open source project with ops, ops droid. So like something like that, having, when you see like that and you see, you know, how capable that, that library, that framework is, I think that demonstrates a skill set a lot more than saying, um, I, I have three years experience in, in X, Y, Z. Uh, and, and of course you can say that, but different people have, you know, some people have done you know, 10 years of say PHP and then someone else has done three and they, they can produce the same type of software. Um, so the, when I see those, those um, job specs where they're asking for something like, you've, have you done seven years PHP? I don't really think that's the, the question that they should be asking. It's more, this is the, the kind of products we want at our company how what have you demonstrated in your past that shows us that you can create that type of product um of course the experience one is an easy question to ask of developers but i've seen developers come in along now and what they know now in just a short space of time is incredible like i look on twitter and people do like a course and they know react or view and they're doing incredible things and that to me just that shows you know, the, the amount of time someone spends, you know, working with a, a programming language isn't the best rep representation sometimes. Yeah, and but I think just... in the past, um, it was the bar or the entry level bar was a bit lower than now because now you have so many new frameworks, uh, so many uh, new languages even, and so, so many things are, are popular and then they stop being popular and then they're popular yeah. again, like PHP, like you mentioned. Um, there was a time where you said, ah, I program in PHP and people were like, oh, really? Uh, and I think <laughs> now you see more developers um, going back to PHP because uh, mostly of Laravel. Um, and, and I think in a way, the bar is a little bit higher than maybe five years ago. Uh, so I started learning how to code uh, four years ago. And uh, I've seen a huge difference, even on the job offers, like I mentioned, you could find some job offers for junior developers and et cetera. And now it's a bit hard to find a position for junior developer, um, especially in UK. Um, and you, you see the requirements, they, they ask more of you. Uh, and in a way you kind of competing with more people. And a lot of times it's like more talented people uh, than than you or, or something and you're like, okay, so if someone is creating this amazing full stack uh, pro, uh, projects, I have to do 10 different full stack projects. So I'm <laughs> better than this person. Um, saying that, uh, comparing yourself to other um, developers is not the great way to go, I, I would say, because um, yeah. I think when we are when we are starting, we kind of do that mistake. I, I know I've done. I saw some some great developers, and I, I was looking at what they were doing, and I'm like, damn, I'm, I can't do anything because they create ten projects in three months, and uh, I'm stuck on one. Um, <laughs> so in a way, it's kind of like use whatever other developers um, create and use that as a motivation 
or to give you a, a motivational boost where you can say, okay, I need to get my game on and I need to work harder. Um, it's true. Actually, I, I know I know how how easy it is to, to look at a developer or look at even developers in your own team and to see, oh my goodness, like how do they know this stuff? You know, you could just see that gap in, in knowledge or capabilities. And um, it can be difficult to, to not like want to rush and catch up. Cause I, I do remember my first year, I think because I didn't do computer science and I know a lot of developers who didn't study at university, um, where you feel a bit self-conscious that there are unknown, there are unknown unknowns. You, you don't realize, you know there's a gaps in your knowledge, but you just don't know what they are. And I remember that first year I was working like insane hours and I would be coming home and doing more and on the weekends, like coding more and, and learning more. Um, just because I, I saw, I was, when I, when I say it, the senior developers there, one did like a, a robotics end of year course at university. <laughs> and you, if I'm comparing myself to him, of course, I'm not gonna catch up. Like he's always going to continually improve. But in my mind, I was like, I need to get to some sort of level where, you know, I'm, I'm in some like ballpark range of, compar of, of comparison. And that's not healthy because I did get quite sick <laughs> within the first two years and got very stressed. And it took me about four years before I, I learned that actually it's, it's quite okay to not know everything before you turn up to work, that you can tell your boss and say, I don't understand how to achieve this, but if you give us a bit of time to prototype this idea, we can do a bit of research and we can get a product out or we can create like an MVP version with the knowledge we do have. It's taken me years to, to get to that point, but I think that's just... So, so those two years or three years um, when you were starting, were you just working full-time on the internship plus coding on your free time and trying to catch up all the things that you, you think that you, you were lacking and uh, trying to catch up with, uh, with other people then? Yeah. In fairness, during the internship, I didn't feel any pressure because I know they weren't, they weren't paying me to deliver results. They were paying me to help with a lot of like the grunt stuff, like the, the more boring stuff, like HTML emails. And then I would get a little bit of the exciting tasks um, once I finished those. So I knew there was zero pressure, but when it offered me the job um, and I, I, I quit my, my weekend job, then like my spare time, everything went all in. Um, and yes, granted, like I did learn a lot. I mean, at the time, that's when JavaScript framework started to come out. And the first one was, I think, Backbone. Backbone, I think, disappeared and then underscore came through. Um, and, then, and then eventually, I think Angular came out. Um, but I was, I was quite obsessive about learning all these, these frameworks and convincing um, the senior developer that we should use them. For anything, we should just use, <laughs> we should just use any of these frameworks because you have a framework on the back end, and they brought me on as a front end developer. I was like, we should have frameworks on the front end. It makes sense. And there was one project where I got to to um, use. It wasn't actually a JavaScript framework. I I kind of built one. Um, and in fairness, looking back, I, it was the worst code ever. But at the time, I was really proud of it. Of course. Uh, but I, I, I think the first year you want to learn as much as you can, but there has to be some balance. And I, I didn't really have anyone to, to say like, slow down. <laughs> I understand that completely. Uh, because looking at what I've been doing so far, um, and sometimes it's, it's hard. And I, I think a lot of, uh, self-taught developers experience burnout because of that um, we always try to catch up and we know that um, maybe because you we don't have a CS degree um, or uh, like uh, any IT background in a way um, we always feel that we are we have to catch up 
you know, yeah. and also you love coding, you love what you're doing. So you was like, I want to learn everything. Um, <laughs> and yeah, working full time in my case, uh, and I do shift work, so it's a bit hard for me to have a regular schedule. Um, and then sometimes I work 14 hours, other times I work three. Uh, it, it's it's odd. Uh, so yeah, every day is different and I work with a different team every single day. Um, and still I come home and I still spend at least one hour looking at code. Even if I don't change anything, I'm still looking at it and you know, reading something or trying to improve myself. Uh, and last year, um, around March, I felt massively burned out. Uh, because I've been going at it for almost four years straight. So every single day off I had, I was spending 12 hours, 13 hours um, in front of the computer, learning how to code uh, or doing something. Uh, Opsroid, like you mentioned, uh, is not a, a project that I've created. Uh, I'm a maintainer for it. Uh, Jacob um, created that project and it was my first uh, open source project that I've contributed. And in a way, um, <laughs> So Opsroid is Jacob's pet project, but it's kind of mine as well because it was the first project that I've contributed and it was what made me fall in love more with open source and coding and uh, yeah, seeing all the things. And as you mentioned, you look back at your code and you're like, wow, this is atrocious. But then you <laughs> may also realize, but I've grown so much looking back it's at true. what I've created uh, to what I have now. Um, it's just amazing. And if you think about it now, you're like, no, I didn't really grow that much. And then you look code that you've wrote, uh, written, yes, uh, not yesterday, uh, one year ago or something like that. And you're like, okay, yeah, it definitely improves a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's true. Actually, what, I guess when you, when you first started, what languages were you looking at? Was it like obvious you was going to do maybe Python or did you look at a range of different ones and then so, stick with? So the first language ever that I have ever looked at was Java. And oh, hey. I went as far as writing Hello World uh, in Java. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is because, uh, so I had this um, a friend of mine um, that was studying computer science um, and we were friends uh, when I, we were little uh, teenagers uh, and then things with life, we stopped, we lost contact and then we um, somehow, I don't even remember how, we, we kind of met up again and we started talking and I always wanted to do something with computers. So my biggest dream was to do something uh, working in a gaming industry, industry because I was a massive gamer when I was younger and I just wanted to do something like that. Um, unfortunately, I had really bad teachers, uh, a math teacher, um, and they made me feel that I was too dumb to learn math. So that dream of um, wanting to do something in the game industry will will be impossible because if you don't have a good grasp of math, you won't be able to um, do anything in in the gaming industry, really. Um, or at least that was my my opinion at the time. So so yeah, um, I met up with uh, my friend and um, she was studying. I was like, man, I would love to do something like that. So yeah, I'm studying Java. And, we were start talking about what she was doing in the university. I was uh, studying tourism at the time, um, and I finished a tourism degree. Um, and I just like I need to do something. I, so she lent me a book uh, of Java, of Java, and um, I was like, okay, I'm gonna start learning some. Um, so yeah, I did some basic stuff like Hello World. Uh, I think I did something with um, uh, time zones like display the a clock that was running. So it was like very, very basic things. Um, but then I started working at the same time as studying. So I had no time whatsoever. Uh, and I kind of always felt that I wanted to do something. So after I finished the, the degree, I was uh, selling uh, insurance. Um, and I did that for one year after I've um, I finished the degree. So it was about two years, three years, something like that. Um, and I had quite a lot of time, even though I was working all the time, it was commission-based, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't have 
uh, I didn't have a salary unless I sold insurance. Um, so then I said, okay, I need to do something with code because I, I, I missed that. And I, it was kind of like assembling a puzzle, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I need to do something with that. So I, I started by, uh, I started with a course uh, in uh, Code Academy. And I believe the first oh, nice. one was uh, JavaScript. Uh, and I did all of the little courses. I think it was Python, JavaScript, and um, uh, Ruby. I think they had the three ones. Um, wow. And I did all of them. And I just, yeah, this is really cool. I need to do something. Uh, and that's when, in my, my opinion, that's when I got introduced to the uh, MOOCs, you know, the online courses. Uh, uh, you said... M O O C. I think it's M O O C. Well, this multi online uh, course thingy, um, like um, I'll have to Google that. I'll have to check, maybe it's not it how out. you say. <laughs> 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 but but yeah, I, I did uh, edX.org. Uh, I did the MIT X course introduction to computer science and um, oh, wow. algorithms with Python. Or something like that um, and the course was extremely hard it was really tough but uh, we had um, a really nice group of people that uh, we got together uh, there was um, a chat room and uh, we were trying to solve the problems together and uh, we we spent all the time there I remember that even at work, I kept thinking about the problems that I had. And I was like, I need to try to find a solution for this. And uh, I was like writing notes when I had an idea and stuff like that, you know. Uh, but then I came to, I decided to move to UK. I wanted to live abroad for three, at least three months. Um, so I moved to UK and I didn't have the, um, I didn't have internet, uh, the room that I was living was um, a bit dodgy <laughs> and um, yeah, then I got a job and I was working insane hours uh, in a kitchen. So, so I failed the course because I, you had to submit um, every week, you had to do a problem set and if you didn't do the problem set, you just, you wouldn't be able to, to do it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you couldn't finish the course. Um, that sounds a bit tough. That's quite yeah. tough. Why <laughs> there's no chance to catch up? Mm. That's impressive. I, I've never I've never seen or looked at um, any online MIT courses. Mm. So that sounds really interesting because I, I I would love to to even just to to try um, to do maybe a module a CS module and see how I get along. Um, that's incredible. Sorry, I interrupted. No, it's all right. It's fine. Uh, uh, but then I got a job as a flight attendant and um, I was so, well, I'm still am, but I was so in love with traveling and finding new countries and etc. that my first two years, um, I was just doing everything. So every single day off I had, I was going somewhere. Um, and I keep going back and forth. Uh, and I was like, yes, I'm going to be a traveler and it's amazing. Um, <laughs> and then after two years, that kind of, I don't know how to even to say it. I just said, okay, yeah, I've traveled a lot, but there is something that is missing. Uh, and yeah, one day I was getting ready to go to work and I was listening to a podcast and um, they were talking about, uh, you know, finding your passion and etc. And they were saying that uh, you should focus on one thing that uh, you you don't even see the time passing. And I, that kind of ringed to me. And I was like, to me, the thing that I just could spend hours doing, and I didn't even care if I didn't have food or whatever, uh, <laughs> was code. And then I came back to that MITx course. Uh, I used to spend do all-nighters trying to solve a problem and I said you know what 
the next open course uh, because uh, they go with seasons i think there's twice a, a year you can do the, the that M uh, mitx course um the next one i'm gonna do each and i know i have the time for each and i'm gonna finish the course uh, and that's what uh, what i started uh, this massive story to say i started with python because the course from mit uh, was in python so i did a little bit of java but i, I don't even remember anything uh, so yeah i did um, uh, python and obstroid is made in python is written in python um, but i always wanted to learn react and javascript so yeah it's been almost uh, one year uh, and I've been doing some React stuff, and I've been learning JavaScript as well, um, because Goodbye. I always, I always thought you need to learn one language very well, um, yes. before or at least in my my head is like, I need to learn Python very well, and then I will focus on another language, uh, and, I, and it really helped me when when I was um, learning React and JavaScript because I was like, okay. You do this in Python uh, in JavaScript is like this. So maybe if I do something like that, and even sometimes when I do this problem set, uh, pro uh, coding yeah. challenges, I'm like, okay, in, in Python, I'll do it like that. So maybe in JavaScript is going to work. It's, <laughs> it's not the right way to do it in the JavaScript <laughs> way, but it's still, you can beat the code. So I'm like, yeah, I'm happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a good point when you, when you say that, because what do you call it, uh, being a polyglot? developer something like that guess so. <laughs> <laughs> that what they call it because in languages it's funny um I've, I've spent time trying to learn spanish and i've never gotten fluent but just enough to be able to speak it but what i found is like the families of languages you, when you learn spanish you can like pick up maybe uh, or you speak portuguese of course i can pick up a, a, a book in portuguese and actually i can and understand quite a bit of it just because like I'm able to, to translate a little bit from what I know in Spanish mm -hmm. um, through. And it's the same, I think Romanian, I, I discovered was quite similar as well. I guess they're, they're Latin based. Yeah, exactly. And so I feel like, I feel like, yeah, in, in computer, in computer languages, you have like families. I feel like JavaScript, PHP, Ruby, they're part of like Python, are part of these like dynamic languages. And then you have Java and C sharp <laughs> and those ones. And so I think it's, it's great when you, you're able to, to translate, you know, from one to another, yeah, it helps. It, it opens up your mind to, to ways of different ways of solving problems. Um, and yeah. And it's, it's also why I, I think it's really important. Uh, I'm not sure if you agree with that, but uh, it's all important to you for you to pick up a different language that does something uh, a little different than what you're used to. So let's say if uh, you're doing um, Python uh, and you decide to pick up Go, so the way that you write Go will be different than the way that you write Python. Uh, and, and if you start getting practice and you start understanding how to do something in Go, um, you, you can actually uh, grow because then when you go back, you can see a different way or a, a, yeah, you can see, uh, you can find a different way to solve a problem that maybe you wouldn't realize uh, that you could do it a different way because uh, you've been doing it the same style all the time, if, if you know what I mean. It's true. A hundred percent agree. I, it's literally because I had the opportunity of working with a Java team very briefly um, that I didn't realize a language could be so strict, having done JavaScript and PHP. And when I saw that, I was just, I was baffled, like <laughs> why things weren't working. Um, because I was using like the, I was, I was using a class that didn't, didn't inherit from the, the right base. And when I did that, I was like, oh my days, PHP would be like, coding in PHP would be so much better if I could have like Scarlet types. Of course you, you can't have it, but you can, you can have types to some degree. And it actually made, I think it made me a better PHP developer because of that experience. But um, I, I would like love to learn Go. I've only seen it written. Like I've tried to look at Kubernetes like under the hood. <laughs> it's just, it's Go for days. <laughs> and yeah, I, couldn't, I don't think I could ever contribute to that um, 
at least within a year or, or so, I think I would have to learn, go for a long time before uh, I could do anything with that. But I, I wholeheartedly agree that being able to, you don't have to be an expert in these other languages, but just learning about them gives you a different uh, viewpoint that will help you in your main language. So definitely, I wanted to ask you, I did have a question. Okay. Because there, there is a, uh, there is like a, a trend to like bash full stack developers. And I don't know if, <laughs> I guess it's true. It's okay to bash, uh, bash full stacks. Um, but I, I see you do design, like I saw your, your website and you put like a dark mode sort of style when you create stuff. Do you, do you think that there is, um, it is possible to be a full stack developer or do you think, uh, we are just cheating? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think you can be a full stack developer. Um, I, I mean, the only thing or the first and only thing I've done so far that I would consider full stack is that project I've done, a uh, thumbs up news project, which I'm using a Django backend and the next JS front end. Um, so yeah, you nice. can definitely, um, be a full stack developer. Uh, in my opinion, or at least in my case, uh, I can do something with uh, Adobe XD and I can do some design, but I would never be a designer unless I focus 100% to be a designer. Um, and in my, <laughs> this might be a bit silly to say, but when I'm designing something, in back, the back of my head is like, I should be coding instead. You know? <laughs> um, so I, I enjoy designing when I'm tired because it's a different um, mindset so I can actually have a rest or I can even put some uh, a series on Netflix or something and I just have it in the background and I try to design something but my design skills are not that amazing um, at least I don't think so and um, I would like to differ <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I look at the, the blank screen for so long and I'm like okay I'm just gonna do something else because this is just not going um, and I'm a bit, yeah, I, I prefer dark modes um, for pretty much everything. Um, it's just my, my preference. Uh, but yeah, I think you can be a full stack developer, uh, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I guess in a, in a full stack developer, uh, unless you, you maybe are a senior, I'm not sure, you have more experience than me, but you will always have one particular Part that you enjoy doing more, so you might do more back end, and you're more comfortable with back end than front end. That's true, actually. I think I, I didn't have any intentions of being a full set developer. I didn't know what they were um, when I started out. I don't even think front end developers was a. Th like I didn't really hear much about uh, front end developers when I started out. Anyways, it was just your your PHP developer, your <laughs> like Ruby developer, or something like that. Um, but actually, I, I, I find when you're like working on, especially on your, either you're in a small team or working on your own projects, you just end up just having to do all these other other things. So it's a bit weird to like, I don't really know if there's a, like a real, I don't know if there's like a real definition of a full set developer. It's with someone that just has to do a range of things <laughs> because the team is too small to get specialists. <laughs> So, so what you're saying is uh, a full stack developer is just um, a software engineer, really. You just do whatever you have to do to get it done. <laughs> get it working. <laughs> Try to do a quality job but, and understand like enough to get it working. And then, you know, when the team gets bigger, you bring in a specialist and the, the, you know, the serious, the serious folks that know, know it like in their dreams. So, so I think that's what it is. That, that will actually fit pretty well on a question that someone on the chat had. Um, uh, Lumberjacker was asking, uh, so do you think, what do you think it's great to work at? Do you would say a startup or a multinational company? And um, from your experience, kind of what would you prefer? I feel like this is the worst question. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's because I... 
I, you know, I work at a startup now. And if I say something else, they're going to kill me on Monday morning. <laughs> um, no, I, I enjoy working at a startup. Um, I didn't think I would because, you know, my idea of working at a startup is just lots of pressure, lots of stress, late nights, early mornings, over weekends. That was my idea. And um, when I met um, the team at Kama, Kama Data, um, of course, they said, if we need to get something out the door, and um, if we can, you know, we'd love you to, you know, work, work to get it done. But, you know, we are, we believe that you have a life outside of work. And like, to this day, they've, they've totally respected that they, they are very balanced people. So I, I can't really speak for other startups. And I don't really know what I would have experienced somewhere else. But um, I thoroughly enjoy it. And uh, I've worked in like bigger companies where there's like, there's like a hiding place for you. for me as a developer, I can work in my own little space and, and no one really knows <laughs> what I'm doing. And that's great because I can get along with what, whatever I have, but here there's literally no hiding place. If I screw up, it's like, it's me and, or two other, two or three other people, no one else. So it's good for ownership to, to be able to create a product and you get to see it directly going out the door and you're responsible um, along with your teammates from like front to the end. Um, but I have no preference necessarily. I just like where I am right now. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> because I think, um, and I, I, this is what I've been reading about uh, opinions of other developers is that uh, a multinational company or even a big company your work description is more rigid. So let's say you're hired as a front-end developer on a big company, you're probably just gonna be doing front-end work and that's it. You might have the opportunity if you ask very nicely to your PM that, uh, <laughs> oh, can I do something on the back end, please? And you yeah. might get the chance. Whilst on a startup is like, okay, yeah, you are hired as a front end, but look, we need something done on the back end. So can you just hop and do it because we need to do it. And you have a smaller team, so you're going to have to do more roles than your job description is. But in a way, yes. it's like you also have more freedom to go from one position to another. Ash, that's a good point. You do have a lot of freedom. Um, I mean, I work with like really, really talented, really smart developers, and they are so humble. At, at the same time, literally any single one of us could be asked to, to deliver an aspect of the product. And you're talking about doing like the, the UI, the API, the database, you know, setting up, you know, setting up a server setting up load balancers, AWS infrastructure, the whole thing, you know, front to back with testing. And, and that's, that's something that um, at other places, I would be very siloed and focused on, you know, one aspect. But um, over the years, I find that the more you get to, to, you don't have to work across the whole stack all the time, but the more you get a chance to work at different pieces, you know, as a developer, I know what I need to do to make my life easier in terms of the upside of things that helps. Or if I do front end, I know what I need that of an API to make the front end, like the front end work easier. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's good to be able to try different sides, sides of things just to know who, who you are causing pain for <laughs> <laughs> on the other side. And then a startup, you, you have to do all your, like everyone has to do it themselves. Um, so yeah, but also, I would, I would, sorry, go on. No, no, no. I just, I would highly recommend working at a startup as long as it's not a place that's trying to kill you. Unless you're, <laughs> unless you're really young and you have that energy. Then that's fine. <laughs> uh, I also think if you ever decide to work for a massive company, when you have an experience as a developer in a startup where you have done so many different roles, uh, that's just a plus when you try to apply to a different uh, company or even to a bigger company than what um, your current company is. Let's say that you want to work at, I don't know, 
Google or something and say, yeah, I want to be hired as a front-end developer in, at Google, but I've done all of these things. And they're like, oh, awesome. So maybe you can do something different. Yeah, then, actually, it could be a curse. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know absolutely nothing at all. That's basically what you're saying. You know it's nothing at all. <laughs> kind of thing of um, uh, jack of all trades. Uh, master master of none. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there is also a second bit as well, isn't it? That is um, a better master of one. I think that's the whole the whole sentence of that uh, of that uh, <laughs> saying. Uh, so so yeah. And uh, I've I'm part of a, a group where we of makers where they create products from nothing. And um, it's kind of like working a startup, but you're just not getting paid for it. Uh, or the idea is to eventually you get paid for it. And um, I've seen some some projects and some products that people made up, and I'm just like astounded that just a single person can do so much. Uh, and it's it's insane. Like if you go to indie indie hackers, and there's so many good things that just started by one person. Um, and you are developing uh, Prions uh, CSS um, library? Yes. How is that, that going? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Um, I spent, instead of actually work, working on Prions itself, I, I spent the last month building things with Prions. And actually, that's been helpful, um, just trying to figure out what I would be experiencing as a user. So I built a site for my sister. Um, she sells like uh, these these like really nice smelling hair oils. Um, I haven't put it in my hair today. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why I haven't put the camera on. And I'm building one for my my mom because she's a, a singer slash vocal coach, like a professional singer. Um, and I think like I just I didn't discover functional CSS like myself. I didn't come up with it. It's just tachyons like came onto my radar about two years ago. And I was I was working at a, like a digital agency, and you're creating websites um, very frequently, and you get to a certain point where you have this deja vu moment, where you're like, okay, I'm creating a card element again, I'm creating an avatar again, <laughs> and I'm writing like BEM from scratch every time. Surely there must be some sort of system that I can use to to meet the designer's needs and have the flexibility they need and also have some sort of standard, um, you know, some rules in place to put together a site and, and functional CSS seem like the best thing for, for that use case. Um, but now I use it to design in a browser. So I, I, I pull up uh, prions and I use a CLI tool to generate my, my style sheet. And then I start just creating components or grabbing ones I've created before. And I'm able to, to do it a lot quickly, a lot quicker than before. So, um, and, and a lot of times, uh, the one of the main bits of success for any project that you create is if it kind of scratches your own itch. Because if you <laughs> if you don't use your own product, how the hell do you expect to know what you need to include? Because you might be working on a specific feature for months and then. No one uses it because in your in your head it's amazing, but you don't use your product, so it's like, well, <laughs> hey, this idea is good, but no one cares about it. <laughs> I guess it can be the same with Popstride. I can't remember who who it was that was was taking was creating a chatbot for was it um, Discord? Uh, and I was like, I can't remember who it was. I think it was on your channel. It was a conversation on uh, a previous video. Uh, but then I was like, you know what? I couldn't create anything from scratch. If I was to do a, a chatbot, I would just like straight away go to Opstroid. I think I've gotten to a point where I don't want to create stuff from scratch now. I just want to like, <laughs> I just want to get to what I want to do and find a library that gets me like 80% there and then the rest, <laughs> the rest I don't mind doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I understand that. And let's be honest, a lot of projects, they are all kind of relying on a lot of other libraries anyway. Um, so unless you are building a library from scratch, uh, you're always going to be using something uh, yeah. that someone already created. Uh, like 
you mentioned Opsroid. Uh, in Opsroid, um, we have the connectors that connect to different chat services. And most of the times, we just decide to go and choose a specific library because then we just have to maintain that. Uh, we have um, a, a parser that uses Dialogflow, which is the NL, um, NLU, uh, so natural language, um, whatever the U stands for. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a natural language, uh, natural language uh, processing from Google oh, yeah. or Google Purchase um, Dialogflow. Um, and they changed their API. And we're like, oh, uh, this is probably going to break the matcher on our end. And it doesn't because we are using this library, so then we don't have to worry about it. Um, nice. And yeah. Do you think that contributing to open source, um, it's very important if you're looking for a position or projects are more important? That's a, uh, is a good question. I don't necessarily think open source is important. I think it's nice. I think it's nice to do to be able to like contribute back um, to the community because for me, I I found that I relied heavily, I, I rely heavily on open source technology. Even now, um, I don't know any development team that tries to build anything truly from scratch. You know, you might do it for fun, just to scratch like your own itch and just to learn how things work. But in like any professional software, we use a lot of open source. So I think it's good to contribute back. Um, I think when you're working in companies where the, the source code is hidden or the product isn't visible um, to like the, the, the wider world, having something open source might be a benefit to, to demonstrate your capabilities as a developer. Um, but if say you're a developer, I don't know, GitHub, and you say you're the front end, <laughs> front end developer at GitHub, anyone can go on GitHub and just look around and see, okay, I, I can see what you've been contributing to. But some companies, you don't know what it, what it is their dashboard looks like because you don't have access to their, their products. So um, I think it's helpful, definitely. But I know a lot of developers who are very successful and they haven't, they haven't shared anything on GitHub or anywhere else. And they are like incredibly capable, capable people. So um, I wouldn't say don't do it. I would say definitely if you can do it, but don't feel, don't feel pressured to, to maintain open source library um, if, if you don't have the time to do it. So it just, it's just a plus uh, if you have that backend then, uh, or if you have that, um, that experience. Because then if you contribute to open source, uh, or if you use GitHub, you probably already know Git. Uh, you probably already know the basic of uh, source control. Uh, you probably know how to open a PR or how to create an issue. And yeah, yeah most, most companies use Git as uh, their source control anyway. That's just like a plus. But if you I do definitely... it... Uh, sorry. <laughs> but if you, no, do no. It, if you do it like uh, on a... Um, on a project that's your own project, you're probably not gonna open an issue and then submit the PR. You just push the master and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I can for you. You probably experienced it because I haven't uh, contributed much to um, other open source projects. Um, but you 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 probably learned so much from working with like a variety of people. Um, if you're working in a team, you're working with maybe three or four. Um, but something something on GitHub, like an open source project on GitHub, where you get to to be part of like a big community, maybe like double digit contributors, learning from how they do things, I think is very helpful. And actually, I like I think I snooped on the, the Opsdroid um, the commit history. <laughs> 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 and it's nice to see how things develop and um, and looking at that. So it is beneficial to 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 learn how to work with others, especially if you don't have that that in your own company, maybe they make you work by yourself or you don't get a chance to, to work with others. I can see the benefit of of jumping on an open source project sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Actually, 
how do you find, um, especially, I, I guess, with internal projects, like with a company, maybe there are certain rules and principles that, like, the, you know, that is set by a lead developer. But on open source projects, maybe they aren't, it's not as strict. How do you find it working on an open source project? Maybe when someone submitted a PR and they've done things a bit differently, do you like mind about, you know, like enforcing certain standards or do you just say, as long as the test pass and it works, it's okay? Um, well, being the maintainer for Opstroid, um, depending of the PR that um, I'm reviewing, uh, there is a particular uh, branch of uh, PRs that's been raised that um, integrate um, Matrix um, to Opstroid. Uh, I don't really grasp the Matrix that much, and um, I've I've just seen what the, the contributors were doing and the other maintainers were, the, were reviewing and suggesting. So I, I'm seeing how they do it, but uh, I don't really understand it fully to feel that I should uh, give my two cents on it. We have a uh, quite good um, sort of rules that we expect um, when you contribute to Opstroid. So we expect that you, you're going to have to write tests that will cover 100% of the um, of the code that you just wrote. Uh, we expect you to add documentation if you're making some changes that require documentation. But the code itself, not really, um, unless you do something that could be done a little bit different. We could suggest, oh, maybe you could do it this way. But a lot of times um, we are happy to just accept your version. And you know, I've been contributing for almost four years to Opstroid and there was a few things uh, and uh, just recently I, I found a, a big issue with a change that I've done a few months ago um, and I was like oh yeah this is broken let me see who who broke it and I was like oh crap it was me <laughs> <laughs> and then looking at that code I was like oh actually I should have done differently and the code that I wrote should have been written differently but um, yeah it, it's hard to specify a way to write code because uh, every person will address a problem different uh, we use black to link the the code so then it's automatic linting so you don't have to really worry about linting and etc and Python um, it's very opinionated of how spaces and so how many uh, indentation and etc. So you have to do the, the code or you have to structure a code in a certain way, uh, but then Black does it automatically for you. So even if you mess linting completely, you just run the command and then it just does it automatically for you. And it's just like magic and it's the best thing ever that I've ever used. <laughs> because <laughs> There was always, when I started, there was always a problem with linting. I was like, oh, crap, yeah, okay. So uh, I submitted the PR, let's see I run, and then the tests were failed, and I knew they were going to fail because of linting. So then I went back and said, okay, yep, this is why it's failing. Uh, one of the main things as well is uh, doc strings. Uh, in, in Python, doc strings are uh, kind of comments that you add to your uh, functions or methods uh, that explain what does that thing do? So then in your, um, uh, in your editor, when you invoke a, a function or a method, that um, description, you know, when you write something and it says uh, the, param the parameters that they expect you and what does the thing do. So uh, whatever you write on the doc screen, um, the, usually the editor will grab that, whatever you've written there. Uh, and there is, there's a few rules to write the doc strings. Um, so yeah, there's always this li little linting things, but it's not a particular set in stone of how to do code itself. As long as the code is fine and doesn't 
doesn't break anything so the test pass we we're happy to just accept it uh usually i, I like to to have uh, another maintainer to check the code as well uh so then uh maybe i approve the code and then someone says yeah i'm happy with that as well and then we just merge it and that's it unless it's something quite uh, small let's say fix a, a bug uh, or something and we know that it's passing so then we just merge it and that's it nice actually that's that's one of the things that i find i i with stack overflow they're quite mean i remember mm -hmm. I, I always imagine if stack overflow was a github project um maybe no prs would get through <laughs> <laughs> i love stack overflow so much but i answered a question on stack overflow and got told for not for answering a, a question that was apparently a bad question. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's nice that you have like a very inclusive way of contributing. And I think the, the more open source projects that, that show that they are inclusive, that's, I think that will like decrease the, the level of anxiety for, for people coming along to, to want to help. Yeah. And again, because Observe was the first project I've contributed and I would say it's a very um, newbie friendly, um, and Jacob had a lot of patience for, for all the mistakes I've done in the past. And I've learned a lot with him because of uh, all the, the things, even messing up um, my commits and uh, breaking everything and um, submitting a million PRs that I uh, should have done as in one. So, so yeah, <laughs> I've, I've grew a lot by contributing to it. Um, and like you said, in contributing to open source helps in the, the way that you see how other people write code and then you probably didn't even realize that you could do something like that um, i know that i contributed to one library uh, golem in the past um, and i've seen so many different things that uh, that library was using that i didn't realize you could do um, like in Python, um, you, could, you can write uh, try and then you do something and then uh, if an uh, exception is raised, you just do pass. So you have a lot of try something, then if an uh, uh, exception is uh, raised, you just pass it and then the, the code just runs and there's no exception raised because you're passing that exception. Uh, and um, I, I've seen on that um, code base that you can do um, context sleep suppress and then the exception so then nice. you don't have to write the pass and uh, i went to observe like hey i just found out that you can do this thing it looks amazing <laughs> let's do it <laughs> and uh, uh, jacob was like yeah let's refactor the code that, that, that sounds cool and um nice yeah from four lines of code at least you turn it into a single line so you do with context sleep uh, suppress then the thing and it just just kind of silently suppress that um, like the exception. Uh, it's yeah, it's like magic. <laughs> <laughs> I love when that happens. Actually, that that's fantastic. That's a great way to learn. That's how I actually learned Vue. Before I learned Vue, I started with React and doing code reviews. I saw someone like, oh, they're very they're very brave to give their code reviews to me because I just be mean. I'm so sorry. <laughs> 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 they give their, their code review to me and I would look at what they were doing. And so I was like, oh, that's how it works. So when it came to, to me working with a view project, I had a, I, okay, of course, I didn't know exactly how to set it up, like, you know, from scratch, but there were a lot of concepts I had learned enough to be able to, to get going quicker than if I had to, to start from zero knowledge. So definitely, I, I, I agree with you, like open source code reviews. These are great ways to learn without actually having to write code. Um, just looking at other people's work. So how and many how, how many languages do you do you code? So you know JavaScript, PHP, uh, Vue. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On the front end, I can only say officially Vue, and I I um, I enjoy using Nuxt. But I I started with React because I saw it. I saw this thing was really popular. So if Facebook has like anything to do with it, um, it's it's going to be quite popular. And it changed how I, you know, I went from jQuery to saying to Angular and saying no. That was I didn't 
I didn't like Angular. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> back to back to jQuery, and then React came out. I was like, of course, this this makes life so much easier. Or so I thought. Um, uh, but yeah, on the front end, I think I can only say officially Vue now because that's I think what I'm most comp competent and comfortable with. On the back end, I'm confident with PHP and Node.js. All the other ones, I think I can get by very slowly, but I wouldn't want to be leading any projects with those other languages unless it's like a simple product. Then I'll be fine. That's okay. Even Python, Python scared me. <laughs> I, I, I had an error. I, I, I inherited some code, and it was, it was like a, a tab issue, and I was like, why is it, why is it breaking? <laughs> and yeah. I didn't understand that Python was like fussy about, you know, indentation. And so, yeah, that that's where I stopped with Python. I fixed the bug and I, I quickly like shut down that project. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the trace back that you get from an error in Python can be a bit scary at first. Yeah. When you know how to read the trace back, it's fine. But the first time you're like, oh crap, everything is red. Everything is breaking. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> I have so much respect for for Python developers um, because there's so much there's so many like uh, machine learning libraries um, out there, and that's that's probably one of the reasons why we have a Python a Python service in our stack just because you know it's so good with that. But um, yeah, I, I I literally don't write any Python from scratch. I I just edit what I see is there, <laughs> <laughs> and I rely heavily on like Google when I. <laughs> when I do that, so a lot of respect to you for that. Just out of curiosity, do you think that Python is a little bit easier for you to write because you don't have to worry so much about uh, semicolons and uh, brackets and etc. Uh, you know what I mean? Because it's oh. kind of pseudo code, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know if it's. If it's easier, I mean, I think it's in some ways it's similar to, to JavaScript or Node.js where it is not going to complain too much. Um, I, I say that it's not going to complain too much, but I, you know, in comparison to working with say C Sharp or Java, I, I would rather work with a dynamic language, um, personally speaking. And then, like, I, I don't know if Python has the same thing, but in PHP, there's a library called PHP Stan, and you can use uh, dot block comments to, like, almost like to annotate what your method inputs and your outputs are. And so you can run static analysis on your PHP without having to compile down into something you can run. So you kind of, like, cheat. You, you kind of get the benefit of a, a, a compiled language without having to wait for it to compile. So Python comes into that bracket. I wouldn't say it is easier. I think it just has to be, um, you just have to learn it. I haven't learned it properly now. <laughs> <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> uh, so uh, I know that you, you told me that uh, you also worked as a, a freelance uh, for um, managing WordPress websites. Was that before your internship or after your internship? Yeah. Uh kind of remember I think that was I was building websites anyways like just for fun but after um the internship I worked for a little bit mm -hmm. and then I after joining a few companies I left uh, a company called WTG to work officially as like a, a freelancer to go in for like short-term contracts and uh, that literally was so scary because I, I went in like you, you're coming in the first day and you're basically, you're like, okay, this is what we want to build. <laughs> and you have to speak directly with the, the clients and it, the, there's the aspects of code that no one talks about where you, you have to talk to people. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and that, that was a, a great experience for me because it actually opened me up to, to, to what the real world needs of the client was. Whereas I guess at a company, there's always a, a middle layer of, of people you go through. So I, I worked, I think it's called Homemade. Um, I did some freelance work, um, at another digital agency before they took me on as a permanent member of staff. But over the years, people have asked me to do their websites and I would charge for that. Um, 
sometimes mm-hmm. not all the time I'd feel bad <laughs> <laughs> for, for everyone because it yeah it felt a bit mean to do with everyone but um I would create web, WordPress with websites and maintain them I think there's a few that I maintain now and I can't tell you where they are they're still running so um, I hope they're still running I will check <laughs> <laughs> after this but no one has come to me saying anything is broken uh, so that's that's they fine should be able to find them. And, <laughs> and you know if it's wordpress um as long as people keep updating their website which uh, wordpress makes it quite easy to update the dependencies and etc it should be fine <laughs> it should be fine some dependent are uh, dependencies that break on wordpress are the worst because it's not like it's hard to like do a rollback on on WordPress. Like if you get that that white screen of death, or whatever they call it, you know you have to go back into the <laughs> you have to go back into the the um the file um, the file manager and just update it. I think I haven't like some of these old projects are not using the the standards that I have. Like now I would use version control, like a hybrid of like Laravel modules with WordPress. So WordPress becomes a dependency. So I have a lot more control over what is being installed. And I would switch off the ability to like update plugins. So I, they can't like just add stuff. They would have to like check and I would test it or something like that. But these old projects on WordPress, I've seen so many WordPress websites just break because someone's updated the plugin and or the version of PHP can't handle like um, this like, there's a, a nice new like spangly plugin and the PHP version on the server is old. Like no, <laughs> <laughs> no, like don't don't stress me out, please. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anything that you kind of hated uh, in particular uh, being a, with being a front end developer? If something that you don't really particularly enjoy doing. IE6, IE7. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I, IE. No, cross browser stuff. <laughs> I say that now, but I, I did enjoy the challenge, but it's not nice when you build something and you think it's working and then someone goes, oh, nope, not on my, not on my browser. And then you work out, oh, you're, you're using that one. Okay. That's not. <laughs> That's uh, that's always the the hardest thing as well, isn't it? It's um, I, I came to um, a particular case with the thumbs up news uh, project that the menu on uh, mobile was broken on Safari and only Safari, Oy. and I was like, man, how I'm gonna change the Safari bit only? Um, luckily, after spending a few hours looking at um, of the flow and blogs and everything I could get my hands on, I managed to find a way to do it. And it, it uses some obscure thing that uses some uh, CSS um, uh, magic tricks by checking if something doesn't work uh, on a particular browser. Uh, so I think they use, uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but I think they use a unit in CSS that Safari doesn't accept and they use the not on that uh, rule so then kind of they are triggering oh, yeah. all the browsers but not Safari because Safari doesn't recognize this unit it's so hacky but it works <laughs> and I'm like that's brilliant I'm gonna use that <laughs> Actually, I used to spin that question to you as well. Actually, what is like the the most the most challenging thing you find on the front end? Uh, for me, it has to be designing. I'm gonna be honest, um, because for me to get to a stage where I'm happy with the design, uh, I'm always thinking I hate my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah, designing for me it's the the biggest problem, and uh, I I know that uh, I. I want to improve it and I even bought the refactoring UI book and I haven't read it yet and I've oh. owned the book for a year and a bit now and I haven't looked at it yet which is very silly of me but yeah <laughs> you have to let me know how it goes I think there there is like 
some some strange truth De as developers we find design hard i am genuinely not a designer i i have managed to somehow create things by fluke and they, they somehow look decent <laughs> in in my opinion and my opinion might be completely wrong so actually what it does look like so, <laughs> so i um what i found i i think last year was a, a a big breakthrough in terms of like design for me because i had the opportunity to work with uh, designers and and to create something and then for them to sit with me and go oh the line height's wrong you're using the wrong font size and you'd be like how do you know and of course they designed it it's like this is not the right orange that i wanted are you using the right hex code i'm like yeah and i'm using the wrong color profile something like that and it was just incredible to sit with them but even then i, I still couldn't have designed anything from scratch um, and i got this book i can't remember what it's called but basically it's not just like about web design it's just about little principles of how to arrange things on a, a page on like a, a piece of paper to make them look balanced and interesting and i followed that and i was able to i was able to create i think um the first version of my mom's um new website i was like oh okay i think i kind of get it and then there's a really good video about colors because i I love colors, but I don't know how to put them together. I couldn't tell you. I, I just about managed to achieve it with my clothes, like how to match my clothes. That's as far as I go. <laughs> and it was great. This guy basically explained how to use colors in a UI, his process. And I was like, it's a process. There are rules. I love rules. I'll follow those rules implicitly. And at the end of it, um, I created prions using his color palette rules. And then my sister's website, um, I created that and so far it's working but i realize if i if i follow like some sort of some sort of process or workflow something at the end comes out looking decent enough that i can i'm not ashamed of it but if i just sit there like i'm picasso and try to come up with something it's, <laughs> it's not going to happen <laughs> it will it just be a hot mess and i think yeah i don't know if designers have a secret or what it is that they do, but I, I can't do, I can't I, just create stuff like that. <laughs> I think is what you said. Uh, a lot of times is just the, um, the set of rules that all the designs kind of uh, follow. And sometimes they break some rules, but they still keep the same kind of like golden rule, let's say. Uh, and uh, they all have kind of the same way to do things. I see quite often. Uh, I use Dribble often to to get um, yeah. uh, to get uh, inspiration for a design, and I see quite often a lot of amazing designs that the, when you go into accessibility, the colors just they look beautiful, but they don't work. Um, yeah, because uh, people won't be able to see it, and uh, you need to make your websites and your apps and everything accessible for everybody. And yeah, it look, might look striking, but if someone can't use your site, then you're already losing points anyway. Uh, so, That's so, a good yeah. point. <laughs> it's uh, true. But a, a question from Copper Birdie. Uh, is there any tech that um, you're looking to play around with? Anything specific? Uh, okay, there's, there's like an endless list, like a growing <laughs> list of tech that you know i've got an arduino right here that i promised um i i got it as a present and i promised i would feel myself trying to get that thing working because it's meant to be for kids and i'm i'm, I'm not a kid so i think I, i've been <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna get like laughed at when i can't actually do it properly um so i need to figure out what what i'm going to do with this arduino um i would love to do more iot stuff because um, I believe as like as developers, it's like code. It can be found in in so many, so many household devices. Um, I think that's like an exciting future for for developers. I, you know, like building websites. I still think that um, there is like a place for us to create websites and products. But um, I think the next big things are like Amazon Echo and all, all that stuff. IoT, 
I mean, not now, but very soon. And of course, it, when when I work at I work at my company, and a lot of the stuff we do has nothing to do with like <laughs> the actual website people see on the front. It's all the work, like gathering data and and you know, like trying to convert unstructured data into structured data, trying to create like intelligent um, determinations out of it. That's where it is. But not every company is like that. Some people just want a website to sell a T-shirt. Um, so, <laughs> so to be able to, to do stuff with IoT sounds like a, a great way of looking forward into the future and, and being relevant um, in my career. But which um, I, which Arduino did you buy? Did you buy just the Arduino itself, or was it a pack that came with a manual and stuff? Here, it, oh yeah, it was a it was I a have, leaving present. I have the same but... one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's terrible. The, the one with the manual where you have um, 20 projects or uh, I don't know, a number of projects and you can follow those little projects, right? It's true. I've, I've scanned the manual. That is as mm. far as I've gone. So okay. you've gone further than me, clearly. <laughs> but you've I, gone wouldn't, further. I wouldn't say that Arduino is just for kids because if you want to learn stuff with um, um, hard drive, Hard drive? Motherboards? Motherboards. I don't and, even know. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you w want to learn about uh, components and stuff like that, uh, you are doing is a brilliant piece that you can play around. And um, it, in a way, it's made as a toy, let's say. So they <laughs> yeah. can take a beating as well. So you won't really ruin it much. Um, and so you, uh, you can use different languages. Um, but the, the main one that they use on that manual is uh, C, which is another fun thing that you can learn C by using Arduino. Uh, and then if you want to do more code things and more IoT, uh, Raspberry Pi is a, is a nice one as well to have. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I will take your word for that. Then someone's lied to me. They said it was for kids. So <laughs> <laughs> I was like, really? So like I found one like to, for, um, this, uh, this lady's uh, son and I was like it's meant to be for kids so he would enjoy <laughs> this <laughs> she said really <laughs> I have an idea for uh, for my Arduino uh, that I want to play around with uh, it's to control my plant uh, soil so then I know when I have to water them properly that's amazing <laughs> that's a great so, idea so yeah. So if you have plants, you can do something like that as well. <laughs> I think I would need that. My plants die. I, I had one in the office. <laughs> I would be the first person to, to buy that. <laughs> Actually, thinking about your question, on a serious note, in terms of, of learning something mm -hmm. properly, I've always wanted to, um, to um, progress my knowledge of domain-driven design. I, I went to a DDD conference I think last year or a year before. And I, I whilst I feel that sometimes um I think the like the way you structure code, I think the main driven design might be unnecessary for a lot of projects. If you have like a, a really important part of your, your domain of you know your your product that you, you want to model and you want to, to do it in a way that has longevity. I, domain driven design seems to fit the bill really well. And I've had the chance of implementing it in, in um, one project, but the, the process of talking to clients and to using the same language that they are, they are saying in the code base, I've seen how beneficial that is. So um, yeah, I'm a big fan of domain driven design. I'm not particularly, um, well, I don't know anything about uh, domain driven design, to be honest. I think that's kind of like the first time I hear about it. So, what is that about? Uh, so <laughs> like a I'm, short version, I guess. <laughs> I think the community would kill me with whatever explanation I have. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the guy who I know who wrote a book about it, I think his name is Eric Evans. And if there's anything that I took away from, from the, 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 what I've read and from the conference, he talks about this thing called the ubiquitous language. 
because what I, I noticed myself, and this was a few years back, um, say, for instance, in a company, they are using the word, I don't know, um, a broadcast to represent a video, like a real time video, I would go in my code and call this, this module the video module, because to me, that is exactly what it is. But then when they're talking to me, they're not talking about the video, they're talking about broadcasting. And so what he's saying is what, you, what ends up happening is the developer is now translating what they are saying, the business is saying into the code and then using a different, completely different language that he or she has come up with. But instead, if you use the business's language, even if a new developer comes in and doesn't really understand the terminology when they look at the code, they can just go to the business and go, we have a broadcast module. How does this, how does broadcast work? And they'll be like, oh, that's the thing where we have live and it has a real time chat and this, that, and the other. And you're like, okay. And the idea of breaking down that barrier between the, the developer and the business, I really like that. Um, it's actually really hard to do because you, you make up one of the most difficult things in programming is trying to like figure out the name of things and maintaining things afterwards. So I, I've seen how that, that cuts down the issue of like understanding what the, the piece of code does because you're relying on a business to tell you what it does. And so, uh, uh, like you said, um, when you had that experience with your uh, freelance is also trying to figure out what the client wants and you try to explain mm -hmm. um, what Try to explain to yourself what does that mean and how you're going to create that. And then sometimes you're going to have to say, yeah, this thing that you want to do um, or this idea that you have, it's just not going to work. Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. So, so I can see definitely a, a potential. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with um, domain-driven development, but it looks uh, pretty interesting and it, it makes sense. So I'm definitely going to look at that. Definitely. I can only encourage it. I have to, like, there are books and there are conferences dedicated to this thing. So I am not close to, to saying that I, I have a full understanding. I would never say that. <laughs> <laughs> and the experts would like, like ban me from ever talking about it again, I'm sure on Twitter. <laughs> They're nice people, but I'm sure they would tell me off and say, you said something that was completely incorrect. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I, I know that uh, I said that we would be chatting for like uh, one hour or so, but it's been so so interesting to and to, to talk not just about your journey, um, and, but also just share with you ideas and just talk about stuff. Uh, yeah, I just really enjoyed that. Um, I hope you don't mind that we've been going a little bit longer <laughs> than uh, that uh, one hour slot. <laughs> no, not at all. Literally, I just saw the time now, and I didn't. I didn't think it was. <laughs> I didn't think it was eight o'clock. Okay, that's yeah. good then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just out of curiosity, uh, because you have experience in different companies and uh, changing jobs and etc. Uh, can you think about one thing that is like the hardest thing to change uh, when you change companies, like? What is the, the one thing that's hard? Is it like finding a, a job offer that interesting for you or that you like to apply? Is it the interview process? Is it leaving a company that you enjoy? Um, yeah, what's... Oh, that's actually a good question. Like the most challenging thing about leaving or... Mm. Do you know what? I've I've been so like privileged. Every company I've been at, I love the people I work with, like genuinely. Every every single time I'm like, wherever I'm gonna go, it's not going to be as good as these, like what I experienced with these guys. Um, and I've worked in an all like all female development team before as well. So I when I left them, I was like, oh, I'm never going to get a chance to work in that environment <laughs> again. Um it's leaving the people. If you like, I've, I'm so thankful. I haven't had to work in a team of like horrible people. And so I always think when I'm leaving the company, like I'm not going to work 
I'm not gonna have this chance again. And the last one I was with before is a, a guy called Rob Waller. He's on on Twitter, and he mentored our team. He was a CTO. He mentored our team um, so well, and he really encouraged me to to pursue opportunities that allowed me to to put my skills to to more challenging problems. Literally, if it wasn't necessarily for for his motivation, you know, I would I would probably still be with those guys before because you know there was no genuine reason for me to change but when he said that I was like okay and then now I'm working with another group of people <laughs> that <laughs> I can't believe how how it's like lightning can strike so many times but it has and so I'm very thankful to to good people like the scare stories I see on Twitter where people are saying they have to work with a mean developer or that famous rock star developer, but he's just horrible to you if you screw up. I've not experienced that yet. I think so. I hope you never experience because yeah, that can be hard to manage. Uh, and I, I can relate to that. Uh, every day that uh, I work, I have a different team. Uh, we, I work on the biggest base on my airline, so we have a lot, a lot of crew members and every day it's a different day. So it will be almost impossible to work with the same people um, twice. Wow. Um, and I, I, I understand that completely. Sometimes you have such a, an amazing team to work for and it's like, I hope I could work with you every single day. <laughs> and then you change, uh, yeah, you finish your day and you feel like you are floating and then you, <laughs> the next day you have a different team it's like yeah this team is good but it's not as good as yesterday <laughs> uh, um, but then yeah uh, it's also very interesting to work with different people every single day because it makes you grow a lot and when when you start seeing that maybe a, a particular conflict is going to arise or you can start you can start reading uh, the team a little bit faster I would say because uh, you start seeing okay yeah this person said that and that person reacted this way so they don't really enjoy it that so let's try to move the subject to something else <laughs> and so do that kind of manage management it's it's interesting uh, but yeah, living a uh, good team, I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, no, I did. Yeah, go on. Sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I did. I, I've never had, I've never experienced that, like working with a different team every day. So I, yeah, that must be really, really interesting. But it must be like hard if you do have that nice, that really nice team where you click to leave that like the next day. <laughs> The, the, the hardest thing is, uh, especially when we are a little bit more tired, uh, like the summer schedule, um, we tend to repeat the questions over and over again because you know that tomorrow you're going to work with a different person. So unless you click with that person uh, and you just start talking about different subjects, uh, unfortunately, you will end up be recurring to the same questions uh, like uh, where did you leave uh, what did you do yesterday and what you're going to do tomorrow um, and sometimes I try to break that but sometimes I don't even realize because I'm tired and I just kind of go on autopilot you know <laughs> and it's like okay yeah no I'm, I'm doing that again I need to stop <laughs> it's true like what's your name and then all of a sudden you go blank <laughs> Oh, word. Yeah, I have to say thank you so much for including me on, on your show. And like, I'm genuinely honored. Um, and I, 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 was, I was speaking to my, my mother and my sister saying, you know, I've been invited onto the show and I don't think I have anything interesting to, to share. So I um, hope it goes well. <laughs> <laughs> I would say otherwise. Uh, like I told you, the, the story that you told me is just uh, amazing and uh, I just enjoy talking with uh, people and I just enjoy learning uh, the progress and the journey of other developers because I'm, I find that I'm on this stage where I would like to um, make a career change and um, 
seeing how other developers got into um, a developer position uh, into tech is just uh, amazing for me. I, I just get, I, I just yeah, I just like to talk to people and. I'm also trying to learn how to um, set a chat and, you know, um, just to kind of like finish off. Um, if you could give a piece of advice to your younger self, you know, before you even um, got that internship position. So when you were uh, studying biomedicine, uh, what would you, what would it be? with all the knowledge you have now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeepers. Um, one, uh, I mean, two things. The, the first one is to, to be humble, knowing that there will always be people smarter than you. Um, and don't use that, don't like take it as a negative, use that to, to learn. Um, but, you know, don't compare. Um, and, and the second thing is, just because you've been a developer for so long doesn't mean you have um you know the right to to tell anyone how they should become a developer or how they should do their code um yes of, of course you can guide people but um dogmatism doesn't help be very pragmatic about how you approach problems and admit that you don't you don't understand things instead of like trying to gloss over them so I don't know if that's a good answer, but <laughs> I think that's a very good this... answer. And uh, I know that I mentioned that before, but uh, I also kind of fell on that trap of comparing myself to other developers and, and thinking that, oh, yeah, I, I'm rubbish because I, I don't know how to do this and that. But other developers, uh, they probably did. Well, they definitely did a different path than you and they encounter different uh, problems and that's also why some folks are more um, skilled than you because they just encounter different um, different problems uh, and uh, just use that as fuel for you to progress but don't say that yeah don't kind of like put you down <laughs> if that makes Definitely. sense don't um, like don't put yourself <laughs> down don't put anyone else down just like <laughs> just carry on <laughs> So yeah, Gemma, thank you so much for um, chatting with me. And um, I know that we've been going for longer than than I said, so I really appreciate. And uh, it's it's been lovely. And um, I will look forward to have a chat with you in the future. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to speak with you, Fabio.